Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, sub Riemannian seminar. The speaker today is uh, Davide Vittone. He's going to talk about differentiability of intrinsic Lipschitz graphs in Carnot groups. Please, Davide, go ahead. Thanks, Enrico, for both the introduction and the invitation. Thanks to all the organizers for this and also for let me, letting me see so many friends, right? We live in difficult times. It's nice to, to see all of you. Thanks. So as, the, as uh, stated in the title, I want to talk about uh, some differentiability or non-differentiability of intrinsic Lipschitz graphs in the setting of Carnot groups. Uh, so this audience is very well educated on the subject, but let me at least fix the notation. So by G, I denote a Carnot group, so a connected, a Lie group, which is connected, simply connected, nilpotent, whose algebra is stratified, meaning it's direct sum of subspaces, VI, uh, with these properties, okay? So we recover one layer, the J plus one layer, as the, 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 the set spanned by the, the commutators between elements in the first and in the Jth layer. Uh, the last layer, non-empty, so S is the step of the algebra, meaning the last layer is non-empty and it commutes with the, with the whole algebra, so in particular with, with, with V1, okay? Uh, since the exponential map is a diffeomorphism between the algebra and the group, we will uh, always identify them, which is pretty convenient because uh, this gives a nice way of introducing dilations, homogeneous dilations of a factor lambda from the group to itself are defined by uh, multiplication times lambda to the power j, okay, for elements in, uh, in vj, okay, and then extending. These dilations are one parameter uh, group of uh, automorphisms of g, uh, that we call dilations. And we also fix, it will not be really necessary, but for some computations, it will be convenient to have a distance, d, which is left invariant and homogeneous on the group. Homogeneous means uh, it's, um, it's one homogeneous, it's homogeneous of degree one with respect to dilations. Uh, and uh, a particularly relevant uh, uh, Carnot group in this talk is the Eisenberg group, HN is the nth Eisenberg group, which is the Carnot group uh, with step two and associated with uh, the usual Lie algebra. Okay, so we have two n um, vector fields in V1, X1, Xn, Y1, Yn, and one direction T in the second layer. Uh, all commutators between these elements are uh, null except for the G, for each j, xj and yj uh, do not commute. Their bracket is equal to t. And we will also always use these exponential coordinates by which we identify hn with r2 n plus 1, okay, with coordinates x, first n components, y, n plus one to two n components and t to the last component. These are the dilations in this. Okay, so we, we see there is a, an, an, isot an isotropicity here, right? The dilation of a factor lambda uh, multiplies times a factor lambda to the power two, the last component. Okay, so this is about the settings. So now I need to introduce intrinsic Lipschitz graphs or so Lipschitz graphs from an intrinsic viewpoint. Uh, assume that your group G is decomposed as the product of two subgroups W and V, uh, which are homogeneous subgroups, so um, invariant under dilations and complementary. Their, in, their intersection is just the, uh, the ID group identity and assume that the, their product generates the old G, okay? So the classical, uh, the classical setting you should take in mind is uh, Rn, okay? Which can be split as a product or direct sum of say Rk plus Rn minus K, okay? So this is a trivial example of a splitting like this. Uh, let me also say that if the, 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 the Carnot group is Eisenberg, 
the only possible splittings are those given by are those we, where one of the groups is vertical and by vertical i mean it contains this direction t okay can you see my pointer by the way yes okay so vertical means uh, it contains direction t and horizontal means uh, it, it's contained in uh, in r2n so in variables x and y okay plus um uh, the, the the horizontal part has dimension in the splitting uh, as dimension k which cannot be greater than n these are the the only possible splitting of the heisenberg group and given a splitting and a map from w to v or from a subset a of w to v we we, we call we we define its intrinsic graph which is the set of elements w times phi of w as w uh, ranges in a okay uh, if you are in this situation then the graph of a map from rk to rn minus k is a subset of rn which is the classical graph okay uh, we want a notion of Lipschitz continuity for this kind of graphs so given a map from w or a subset of w to v uh, we introduce Actually, Frankie Serapioni and Serra Cassano a few years ago introduced uh, a notion of, of Lipschitz continuity, which is uh, in terms of comparison with cones. Okay. So a map phi is said to be intrinsic Lipschitz if one is able to find an open cone C, which contains V in its in itself so uh, c is a neighborhood of v actually of v minus the origin of course and the following properties hold uh, if you move the cone c so to a vertex at every point p in the graph okay then this cone with vertex a point in the graph doesn't intersect the graph okay uh, this is a very reasonable uh, definition of course, it's equivalent in this Euclidean situation to the classical Lipschitz continuity. Uh, and uh, now there are very uh, there are several evidences that this is the correct notion of intrinsic Lipschitz continuity for a map uh, from W to V, so given a splitting. Uh, let me also say that in general, uh, an intrinsic Lipschitz map phi cannot be better than Elder continuous. Okay. At least, I mean, from Euclidean, uh, from the Euclidean viewpoint, so to say, of classical geometry. Actually, what happens is that one can hope to have better uh, intrinsic uh, regularity properties for for such maps. But, for instance, one could be interested in a Rademacher type theorem. So. Is it true that every intrinsic Lipschitz map is differentiable in some intrinsic sense almost everywhere? So assume A is open, you have an intrinsic Lipschitz map. Can you say that it's differentiable in some sense at almost every point of, uh, of its domain? Uh, what is a reasonable definition of intrinsic differentiability? Uh, the reasonable definition is the following. You say that phi is differentiable at a point W if uh, the blow up of the graph at the corresponding point, so this is a point on the graph, okay, center the graph at, the, uh, at that point and blow up uh, around uh, this point, okay, and see what happens when you blow this, uh, this setup. Well, if it happens that the, the blow up converges to a homogeneous subgroup of G, then we say that phi is intrinsically differentiable at, uh, at the point W. And now for, a, for some years, it has the, the problem about the validity of our Rademacher theorem in Eisenberg group was, was open. Uh, what was known in Eisenberg? Uh, it was known, this is more or less, this was in the folklore, I think, 
Actually, there is a recent preprint by uh, Antonelli and Merlo, who give some very precise statements and also more general ones. Uh, so it was known that when the dimension of the domain was low, and by low I mean between one and then, uh, then a Rademacher theorem holds. And this is essentially due to the fact that in this situation, uh, intrinsic Lipschitz map are Euclidean Lipschitz. Okay. And then you have Rademacher and you, you can exploit classical Rademacher. Uh, this was some, somehow in the folklore. There was another, uh, another situation where Rademacher was known, and it was the case of co dimension one. Okay. When the domain has topological dimension 2n. Uh, this was proved uh, by Frankie Serapion and Sarah Cassano a few years ago. And uh, the key point is the fact that um, intrinsic Lipschitz graph of co-dimension one are uh, boundaries of sets of finite perimeter for which there is a, a, a rectifiability theorem available in Eisenberg. Uh, so I recently showed that actually uh, a Rademacher theorem holds in Heisenberg in every dimension and co-dimension. So in Heisenberg, every intrinsic Lipschitz map for, for any splitting is intrinsically differentiable almost everywhere. So uh, uh, by almost everywhere on W, I, means, I mean with respect to whatever hard measure you put on your the group W, okay? Whatever natural measure you put on W. Uh, I will not deal with some Im all immediate or almost immediate consequences of this theorem. Let me just mention them. Uh, for instance, you can prove a losing type theorem for intrinsic Lipschitz graphs in Heisenberg, I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, an intrinsic Lipschitz map is almost intrinsic C1, C1H. Okay, so an intrinsic, Lip uh, it coincides up to a small set, which can be made as small as you want with a C1H maps, an intrinsic C1 map. Uh, another consequence uh, is that these two notions of classical C1 rectifiability and Lipschitz rectifiability coincide. Uh, a set is rectifiable, C1 rectifiable if it can be covered by uh, countably many C1 submanifolds up to a negligible set. Lipschitz rectifiable is the same where you cover with Lipschitz graphs. Well, the two notions coincide. And eventually, thanks also to results by Corny and Magnani, uh, you can deduce an area formula for intrinsic Lipschitz graphs. Okay, I don't want to, uh, to speak about this. I would rather try to give some flavor about the, the proof of, the, of this theorem, which needs uh, a few tools, a few preparatory tools. So let me discuss them. So something uh, I needed to prove was first extension and approximation theorems for, uh, for intrinsic Lipschitz graphs, uh, which uh, say, states as follow. Um, so first, the extension theorem, uh, assume th this actually doesn't hold the, both the theorems uh, uh, do not hold only in Heisenberg, actually uh, they hold in a wider generality and precisely whenever you're splitting in a Carnot group where the splitting is such that the target V is uh, isometrically isomorphic to RM, equivalently it's a, a, a horizontal subgroup of G, okay? So in this situation, uh, every intrinsic Lipschitz map phi from some domain A of W to V can be extended to an intrinsic Lipschitz map uh, defined on the whole of W, which means that in, uh, in this theorem, you can always assume that A is W itself, okay? Because you can extend uh, the map. Uh, a second result that I needed was the um, an, an approximation theorem. Again, in under the same assumptions on the splitting, one can prove that uh, every intrinsic Lipschitz map phi uh, can be approximated uniform, uniformly 
by smooth maps from W to V in such a way that these maps are uniform intrinsic Lipschitz. So the, the cone, the open cone in the definition of intrinsic Lipschitz continuity can be chosen uh, independently of J, okay? Uh, both results uh, rely on an equivalent definition that, uh, that I gave of intrinsic Lipschitz graphs. Uh, I don't want to discuss it here. Uh, let me just say that uh, there is a way of, um, an equivalent way of defining intrinsic Lipschitz graphs uh, as level sets of Lipschitz functions from the group to, to RM or to V, if you prefer. Okay, there is, there is a way. Uh, I don't want to discuss it. I just have to mention that the extension theorem was known uh, in case, in the case of co-dimension one. This was a, a paper uh, that I wrote a few years ago. And uh, also there is another, a different proof by Franchi and Serapioni. Okay, so extension and approximation theorems are the, the first tool one needs that we will exploit in the sketch of the proof. The second tool I will need uh, is the, the notion of currents in, in Eisenberg groups. Uh, for this, I need to recall a uh, remain complex of differential forms in, in, in Eisenberg, okay? So in the 90s, uh, Riemann uh, found this very interesting uh, complex, exact complex of differential forms. Uh, okay, so here you see arrows from zero going to zero forms, one forms and so on, n forms, Eisenberg n forms, n plus one, blah, 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 until zero, okay? So each element in, um, in this sequence, dkh, uh, is, the, uh, is the set of Heisenberg forms of, uh, with compact support, Heisenberg smooth forms with compact support. You should think of them as uh, smooth, uh, compactly supported sections of a certain space of covectors, okay? So section of this space of some spaces of covector find, found by Riemann. I will use this symbol, which was introduced, I think, by Franchi, Serapioni, and Sarah Cassano, uh, lambda HK. These are covect certain co covectors uh, in Heisenberg. And see that here we have, the arrows are exterior differentiations, right? We have D, these Ds. Uh, these small D are all ex classical exterior differentiation, okay? Except here at the critical level, when passing from N forms to Heisenberg N plus one forms, we did uh, a, different, a different operator. It's not standard, uh, um, uh, different exterior differentiation. It's another complicated operator, uh, which which involves the second second order derivatives and which uh, encodes most of the problems in this complex. Okay, so Riemann introduces these Heisenberg forms. Okay, this natural complex of differential forms, and as in the classical case, we say that. Uh, well, a K current is an element of the dual of Heisenberg K forms with compact support. Uh, so even though the, the, the definition might seem a bit abstract and probably it is, um, the, the, the idea, the typical case you should bear in mind is the case of a smooth submanifold, which defines a current uh, acting on uh, Heisenberg K forms by integration. Okay, so if S is a K, ma uh, K manifold, a smooth K submanifold of D, uh, we take integration of S. This defines a current. So in this sense, currents are uh, generalization of uh, of uh, some manifolds. Uh, given a current T, its boundary is the K minus one current defined by, so, so that Stokes theorem holds, okay? So the boundary of T, of T applied to some K minus one form omega is by definition T applied to the dif differential of omega, whereby dr, I, 
So R stands for remain, okay? And DR is the operator that you find in the complex at the appropriate level, K, okay? So either a small D, exterior differentiation, or, or capital D. Uh, so I must apologize with the experts, okay? Because uh, they will realize that uh, I'm not really precise about uh, these spaces of vectors, which are not exactly, okay, in a, in a good approximation, they can be thought of as smooth vert, uh, sections of certain covectors only, okay? Good, so we have the tools we need to, to start the proof, okay? So uh, we are given a, uh, an intrinsic Lipschitz map phi from W to V. Now, we, by, the, by extension, we can assume that the domain of phi is the whole of W. Then we, we have an, the approximation theorem, so we can approximate it by phi j. Okay, so associated with phi j, there is a natural current, right? The one associating to every omega, the, the integration of omega on, uh, on the graph of phi j, which is a smooth sum manifold. Okay, well, thanks to the fact that these sum manifolds are uniform Lipschitz, you can prove, one can prove that uh, these currents uh, converge weakly star to some current T phi, which is supported on the graph of phi, okay? Uh, so this, the, the approximation theorem is needed to define a, some current, which a posteriori will be the natural current on the graph of phi, okay? And also uh, it's pretty easy to prove that these currents, so since the graph of phi j, since, since phi j are global, right? This, uh, submanifolds, the graph of phi j are boundaryless. So these this currents have, have zero boundaries. So also the limit, so our natural current on, on the graph of phi uh, has no has zero boundary. This will, be, this will be a key information. Also, one can prove that uh, the, the current phi on the graph T phi that we define on the graph of phi uh, can be defined by integration, okay? More precisely, you can, one can find a, 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 a function tau, which is defined on the graph of phi and taking values in the dual of remain covectors, okay? So that the action of T phi on every form is uh, given by the integration on the graph of phi with respect to the Hausdorff measure, okay? So k plus one, uh, k is the dimension of w. So k is the dimension of the graph of phi. Uh, so it turns out that the, um, the Hausdorff dimension of the graph of phi is k plus one. So this is the natural measure, one, one possible natural measure on, on, the, on the graph of phi. Okay, so we integrate with respect to the Hausdorff measure, uh, the pairing between tau and omega and the form on which we are testing the, the current. Okay, so the current, which we now have on, on the graph of phi is also is defined by integration. Now, uh, if you believe in, uh, in mathematics, I would say, uh, you would probably guess that this, this vector, it's a dual of covector. So I, I would call it vector. And this vector should encode some tangential property of the graph of phi. So this tau should be related with the tangent to the graph of phi. So if you believe in Rademacher, and this should, should happen. And so it's pretty natural to, to guess that uh, at points which where tau is roughly constant, okay? So at density points of tau on the graph, so where tau is roughly constant, you would, so the, the guess would be that the, the, the graph is almost, is, is very close to a plane. So the natural guess is that phi should be different, intrinsically differentiable at points where tau is, uh, is roughly constant. So it's, or approximately constant. It's a Lebesgue point with respect to this measure of tau. Excuse and, me, David, uh, uh, could yeah. I ask a question? 
Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, could you say, uh, give a quick sketch of the first part of the slide here? So, I mean, what are the inputs? So, so you're using the fact that this uh, intrinsic Lipschitz condition gives you some control on the, the house or the density of the graph uh, in, in, in K plus one dimensional Hausdorff measure. Is that, I mean, where does the weak star convergence come okay. from? Okay. So, this measure on the graph is Alfors regular. This was proved by Franchi, Serapioni, and Serra Cassano. Uh, so you have uh, differentiability uh, of measures, theorems. Uh, and uh, so at almost every point, tau, um, its approximate limit, if you know, uh, is, is the value of tau at the point. So why is this formula true? Well, the fact is that also this current, these approximating currents can be written in this form, in this integration form for some tau j, okay? Then one realizes that the, the, the uniform Lipschitz continuity of phi reflects into the fact that these vectors tau j are uniformly bounded. So there is a bound which depends only on, on the cone C that you have at the beginning. So these vectors tau j converge uh, uh, weakly star to some vector tau and also these measures. Um, okay, I must also say that these measures on the graph can be seen as push forward of the hard measure you have on W through a proper uh, function. Okay, so if you put all these pieces together you recover this for thanks that's that's exactly what i wanted here thanks You're welcome okay so we have a natural gas which is indeed almost true in the sense that in the sense of the following claim so i claim and the, the, the key of everything is proving this claim so we will prove that phi is differentiable at every point w of the domain where not only uh, the, the corresponding point of the graph is a Lebesgue point of, of this vector tau, but also uh, all the possible blow ups of the graph at the corresponding point are T invariant. By T invariant, I mean that uh, they are invariant along the vertical direction. Okay. Uh, fact the, also, these uh, both properties, but in particular, this one, the second one all uh, almost everywhere on W, okay? Uh, this one is pretty standard, I would say, by standard arguments. This one uh, is not immediate. So the fact that at almost every point, all blow ups of the graphs must be invariant. So in principle, we, we don't have Rademacher. So in principle, we have a hell of a lot of blow, possible blow ups. Well, at almost all points of W, what happens is that all blow ups are T invariant. So invariant in the, in the, in the vertical direction. Okay, so they are foliated by straight vert vertical lines. Uh, this is a consequence of uh, Rademacher's theorem in codimension one. So here we use uh, Franchi, Serapion, and Serra Cassano result. Okay, let me also say that when you have a T invariant blow up, well, a blow up of an intrinsic Lipschitz graph must be intrinsic Lipschitz because the comp property is invariant under dilation, right? And T invariants plus intrinsic Lipschitz means they are Euclidean Lipschitz. Okay, so they are good objects. All blow ups at almost every point are good vertical objects. Okay. So here you have to believe me, these two properties hold at almost every point of W. And now let me try to sketch how to conclude once you are at a point for which these two properties hold. Okay, so fix uh, such a W. Consider one blow up sigma or at the corresponding point and consider the blow up of uh, of the current, remember we have an we we, we define a natural current T phi on on uh, on the graph. Okay, so let's blow it up 
uh, around uh, this point on uh, on the graph okay by blow up of a current i mean the okay we we dilate the current we consider the push forward via, via dilations and see the limit of the current in the weak star sense okay well sigma was the blow up of, at w uh, if we blow the current we obtain a new current which will be uh, supported on sigma on the blow up and which is uh, again obtained by integration and associated with some vector tau bar some constant vector tau bar so exactly by integration as here we had a function tau well now the function is constant and it's exactly the value of tau at the at the fixed point right and what's the the idea well tau was roughly constant around this point right so when you blow this everything up uh, weekly star you are converging to this constant to the value of tau at the point okay so we have a uh, a current which is supporting on the blow up and such that it's obtained by integration with respect to a constant vector tau. Plus, since the current on the graph of phi was boundaryless, also any blow up of the current must be uh, uh, must have boundary zero. Okay, so let me summarize what we did up to now. Okay, so we started with the graph of phi which in principle is a complicated object, an older object, so to say. And we first approximated it by smooth uh, graphs, right? On each graph, we have a natural current. And by taking the limit of these currents, we define a, a current tau t phi or, or supported on the graph of phi. Okay, then we fix the point on the graph uh, with those two properties and we blow up, okay? So in principle, we have many blow up limits, okay? So along different scaling sequences, we, 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 we could get different limits. Let's consider one. So one scaling limit and one limit sigma. Uh, by the way we chose the point, the, the limit sigma is, uh, is vertical. It's Okay, it's T invariant, so it's ruled by vertical lines, so it's Euclidean uh, Lipschitz. On sigma, we define the current without boundary, T sigma. Now, we want to prove Rademacher, so we want to prove that sigma is a plane, and actually it's a unique plane, so there is just one possible blow up. So one way to prove for proving that sigma is a plane is proving that well, sigma we know is a Lipschitz object, so let's prove that at almost points we have the. Uh, so it's a Lipschitz object, object. So almost everywhere it has a tangent plane. Let's prove that wherever you have a tangent plane, you have the same tangent plane. So we fix a point P on sigma, where we have a tangent plane. Actually, Euclidean or Heisenberg tangent is the same by vertical invariance. Okay, so at almost every point P of sigma, we, we have a blow up, a tangent plane. Okay, TP sigma. Let's prove that TP sigma is unique. Okay, so we blow uh, sigma, we, we consider a blow up of sigma around all, uh, a point P. Okay, and we get a, a, a tangent plane. Uh, of course, we also, we, we also get a, a, a current, right? So as we did before, we can also consider the blow up of the current around this point. And we will get a current T sigma P, which is supported on the tangent plane to sigma. Okay, also this current will be without boundary. Okay, so as I said, we want to prove that TP sigma is uniquely determined by tau bar. If we do this, it means that there is just one choice for the tangent plane to sigma. It means that sigma must be a plane itself. And actually only one plane determined by tau bar, okay? And as I said, we also blow up the current T sigma at P to get T sigma P. Again, it's a current which will be supported on the tangent plane to sigma and associated with the same vector tau bar. 
and it will be a current without boundary because it's the blow up of a current without boundary. So now the key in, in all of this is the is a constant TC theorem. For those who know a little bit of currents, this is a key object, a key a key result. Um, let me state it. Uh, consider a vertical K plane pi in Heisenberg. Okay, let's call pi and assume we have a vector tau bar in the dual of Riemann covector. So we, we might call them Riemann's vector if we want. And assume that the current you obtain by integration on pi uh, associated with this constant vector tau bar has zero boundary. Then tau bar is forced to be the tangent vector to pi. There is no other possibility that actually this is not true because the tangent vector to pi is a is a vector is a multi vector right uh, this is a so a dual of all covectors so an element in the dual of all covectors while tau bar is formally is lives in another space okay what what you did use is the following that for every remain covector every heisenberg covector uh, the action of tau bar and the tangent to pi is the same. Is the same. So, all in all, what what does this theorem say? Well, let's apply to this situation. Uh, this tells us that uh, the action on, on Riemann covectors of both tau bar and the tangent to TP sigma is the same. And this, in the end, so after something like 25 pages of computations, uh, tells you that every blow up at sigma uh, must be a fixed plane, which is determined by tau bar, okay? Here I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details, but uh, the idea that, that you should be reminded is that this information tells us that uh, there is just one possibility for tau pi, okay? So tau pi here is determined by tau bar. And in particular here, tau bar determines the tangent to Tp sigma. So the tangent to Tp sigma is, is constant. Uh, which means that sigma itself it's a plane, but then the plane depends also on tau bar. So uh, there is uh, so sigma is also independent from the scaling the possible scaling sequence. Okay, uh, so this is everything I wanted to say about the the, the, the proof of Rademacher. So uh, how much time do I have? Uh, at least fifteen more minutes. Oh wow. Okay, then uh, I, I have time to, to sketch, uh, to, to, to tell a few things about a counter example that we recently found, found with, uh, with Antoine Julia and uh, Sebastiano Nicolus Sigolo, okay? Uh, okay, so, uh, so after proving this, this uh, Rademacher theorem in, uh, in Eisenberg, we started working, uh, in order to, to try to prove, say, uh, Rademacher theorem in step two Carnot groups. Okay, and I must say that we also have some partial results, but okay, intermediate results, I would say. And then at some point we, we find this uh, super easy counterexample, which in a sense it's disappointing, but I also must say that uh, from other viewpoints, it's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, okay. So consider this Carnot group, H1 times R. Uh, H1 and though with the standard coordinates X1, T, X, Y, T in R. So this is R3 and this is R with, with the, and Z is the, the, the coordinate in, the, in R, okay? So this is a Carnot group uh, with step two and uh, where the dimension of the horizontal layer is three and the dimension of the vertical layer is one. So the vertical, so V2 is given by this T direction, okay? And consider the splitting 
uh, W uh, V given by, well, W is a vertical plane in, in H1, okay? So it's, span, it's y, the plane YT, and V is a horizontal uh, plane, okay? Uh, so one direction X in Heisenberg and the other direction Z in R. Now, consider a map phi from W to V of this form, okay? So phi of yt should be something of the form x, z. x is zero. z is a function of t only, u of t. And u, choose u to be uh, a function from r to r, which is one al one al folder, but such that uh, this limit, so if you want the uh, older difference quotient of u at a point t, does not exist for any t. So at every point t, this limit doesn't exist. Well, then this map is in three. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, such a map can be can be constructed. Okay, uh, it's pretty classical. Uh, I would say it's in the folklore. Uh, in the paper we are writing, we will include a construction because we don't know how where. To, to find a reference. And actually, if any of you knows of any reference, please tells us, tell us. Okay. Well, under these assumptions, phi is intrinsic Lipschitz. And this is a consequence of the older continuity, but it is nowhere intrinsically differentiable at any point. It is not intrinsically differentiable at any point. And this is essentially due to this limit, okay? Uh, uh, how can, uh, can I uh, explain this? Uh, you will notice that the intrinsic graph of phi is contained in the set of points of the form zero ytz, okay? And this is an abelian subgroup, homogeneous subgroup of, of uh, uh, of the group H1 times R. And uh, being abelian computations become very simple. I mean, checking that there is some open cone uh, is pretty simple. And uh, the open cone that you can put, uh, so cones are um, like uh, in direction T since uh, the, the, you have the homogeneity too, right? These cones are like, um, have this uh, one half folder continuum, so are like uh, spikes of degree one half. So the, the one half folder continuity of U implies, so is the key ingredient in the intrinsic Lipschitz continuity. Uh, when you consider dilations, right? And since the, 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 the variable T, the vertical variable T scales with a factor two, the fact that this limit doesn't exist show implies that the, the, the graph is nowhere differentiable. Actually, you can do, you can construct phi with even worse properties. So you can construct phi in such a way that at every blow up, uh, sorry, at every point of every point of the of the graph, you have infinitely many blow ups, but none of them is a homogeneous subgroup. So no blow up is a subgroup. And the graph of phi is what uh, technically is called purely C1H unrectifiable. It means that this is a Lipschitz graph which intersects uh, every C1, intrinsic C1 graph or intrinsic C1 sub manifold in a, in a set with zero measure. So in particular, this set is, is not C in C1H rectifiable. It cannot be covered almost everywhere by can, uh, up to negligible sets by countably many uh, C1H submanifolds. So in particular, C1H rectifiability and Lipschitz rectifiability are different notions, okay? And this was pretty, I, I, I think that this counterexample from some 
viewpoint from a certain viewpoint so is particularly striking uh, so for me one one interesting observation is that no blow up is a homogeneous subgroup which means that also if you so in rectifiability theory theory one always look looks at the at measures on the, rather than objects so you put for instance the outer measure on on uh, on your graph and you look at the blow ups of the measure okay well no blow up is flat no blow up of the measure is supported on a flat plane because no blow up of this graph is a subgroup um okay so here i included some one possible construction of you which i think it's pretty classical it's done by uh, self-similarity arguments uh right you start with the function x so the pictures are by uh, sebastiano which i thank <laughs> um you start with the function x from 0 1 to 0 1 okay and then you extend uh, to, to to the whole r in some way okay you start from the function x and then you replace it with a new function which is constructed in this way so you you pick your function on 0 1 you squeeze 0 1 so to cover 0 4 9 right and vertically you squeeze by a factor 2 over 3 okay so at every step you will see that here we have a function on 0 1 and we build a copy of itself on 0 4 over 9 which is scaled by a factor 4 over 9 here and two thirds here vertically and we put three copies of this. So one here from zero to four over nine, one on five over nine, one, see it's easy, it's the same. And between four over nine and five over nine, we put uh, a, a copy which is scaled by a factor one over nine horizontally and one over three vertically. And also uh, we, right, we, we go it, uh, we, we let it go downwards, okay rather than upwards okay so see how it's done and this is another iteration so i believe this construction is pretty classical but if any of you so we, i i don't know where to find it if any of you have us have a reference we will be grateful and yeah i think i can stop here thanks for your attention